You're listening to the Cash Flow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner, your source for investing made easy. Here's Andy Tanner. Welcome to the Cash Flow Academy podcast. I'm Andy Tanner, your host. This is where we make investing as simple as possible. And we have a wonderful guest today. He is a reporter for the Wall Street Journal. He covers financial regulation, and he's joining us from Alexandria, uh, right outside of uh, Washington, D.C. And uh, he has written a number of books, Dark Pools, uh, The Quants. And his latest book, uh, June 2023, is Chaos Kings, How Wall Street Traders Make Billions in the new uh, age of crisis and uh, that'll be available on amazon.com and then lastly his website is scottpattersonbooks.com so scott thank you for taking some time with us to talk a little bit about the chaos uh in the world of trading right now and in the markets this is going to be exciting yeah glad to be here wonderful give us just a a quick background what was it that uh guided you and, and drew you to be interested uh, to, to become a reporter for the journal and also to find the niche of uh, financial markets and regulation? You know, when I was a young uh, English major in college, I had no idea that I would spend the rest of my life writing about the financial markets. I, I graduated uh, with a master's degree in English uh, in 1995 from James Madison and immediately moved to New York City to try to you know, break into writing. So at the time, uh, the dot-com boom was, was really taking off, and there, the uh, financial news outlets were really booming, too, uh, covering that story. So uh, I landed a job with Dow Jones uh, writing breaking news pieces, and Dow Jones owns the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> So it just inevitably led to, you know, I, I had a couple other jobs in between, but uh, in 2004, I uh, started working at WSJ.com, um, writing, covering markets, uh, uh, commodities, hedge funds, and it was it was a very fascinating time to, to be writing about this stuff. I was coming at uh, financial markets from a different perspective, I think, than a lot of people, yeah. um, especially people within Wall Street that you know studied uh, finance and economics. I I've studied uh, 18th century English novels, <laughs> so um, I I just I found the whole thing fascinating. I, I did I definitely started reading up on economics a lot, and uh, in covering hedge funds, uh, that's how I got to know the theme to love and Mark Spitznagel, who were the subjects of the Chaos Kings. Um, I broke a few stories about them in 2007 and have, have known them ever since. Fascinating stuff. This is going to be an exciting uh, episode. Now, uh, Black Swan events, uh, our audience is fairly sophisticated, so we know that that's when things go bad and go down in a hurry. Personally, yeah. as, as, as an investor, I, I struggle to trade these, so I'm interested about the Chaos Kings who trade these. As an investor, I love these. Uh, I don't like the circumstances, and I don't like the fear. But, for example, the last big one I participated in was, of course, COVID. And with the emotions of that, I picked up some of the best bargains of my life. Because there is quite a detachment, often, between the fundamental strength of a company and what it does, and the emotions in the market can get a little steeper and more poignant, more immediate, uh, and that detachment from price is interesting because it goes both ways. You can have a bubble, which is a detachment where you know, we're paying way too much. You know, it's not justified by what the company does and how it performs. But these black swan events are way too little. But I'm interested, first of all, maybe, uh, you know, it, it, chaos theory. I remember in Jurassic Park, Jeff, Jeff Goldblum was this brainiac said, yeah, this is chaos theory. Is that stuff real? Are black swan events real? Chaos theory real? What's your thought? Yeah, you know, the black swan, um, is, the book by Taleb, um, is dedicated to uh, Benoit Mandelbrot, who's one of the key uh, mathematicians and thinkers behind chaos theory. The scene got to know Mandelbrot in the early 2000s after a scene that I recount in the book where he, uh, he attended a speech that Mandelbrot was giving at New York University in which he was using 
uh, his fractal theory, which is you know a, a mm-hmm. sort of a subset of chaos theory, to describe extreme events in financial markets, including bubbles and crashes. And Taleb was fascinated by it. He, he had never considered the possibility that that branch of mathematics could be applied to financial markets. But the, but what Mandelbrot was describing fit within his own experience in markets, having gone through Black Monday in 1987 mm-hmm. and, and a bunch of blowups in uh, the 1990s, uh, you know, other events I described in Chaos Kings. So yeah, there is a fit. It's it's uh, there's a similarity between the uh, chaos theory and black swans in in markets, and and I, what it does is it sort of runs counter to prevailing uh, economic theories that many uh, quants and economists use to describe markets, which is that the market is efficient and is always accurately pricing in uh, information immediately into prices. And, and therefore, the market is, uh, it, it's impossible to beat the market because it's always accurate. Um, what this uh, way of thinking, uh, the, the, you know, how this can be applied is that there are times when, when as you described, prices become detached from the underlying uh, fundamentals, which happens in bubbles and crashes. You know, and obviously, you know, if you've written a book, you know, called The Quants with, you know, quantitative analysis. And certainly there's been uh, many people who have proven uh, for sure. I mean, we'll have the, you know, the use of supercomputing. People call it AI, I guess. Uh, you know, more and more trades. I don't know what the percentage of trades on Wall Street, uh, you know, large institutions is done by computer, but it's a huge number now. I mean, it's a massive yeah. number of yeah. most of the smart money, so, supposedly. So how, how, how does a trader... Uh, that's great if I, you know, if I have a big, if I'm Goldman Sachs and I have a huge AI department or something, but what about the person that's going to read your book? You know, if I pick up Chaos Kings, can traders incorporate black swan theory into their strategies? You know, it, it, depend, it depends on the sophistication of the trader, obviously. I would not recommend, you know, mom and pop trying to implement these strategies in their retirement account. Um, I think that... You know, history shows, you know, and things can always work differently, but history shows that buy and hold of a broad basket of stocks mm-hmm. is generally the best uh, strategy for the long run. Now, if if you're fairly sophisticated, if you have, say, an interactive broker's account, mm-hmm. um, you, you can try to replicate uh, what, what these funds do. Uh, by and and what they do is they purchase far out of the money uh, put options, mm-hmm. which pay off in crashes. So the, the, I didn't want to interrupt. The trouble with it is the, the trouble with it is you know those those trades lose almost all the time. That's and, and it's very hard to manage and and make it profitable over the long run. And it's and what Universa does is uh, it doesn't. The, the hedge fund run by Mark Spitznagel and which Taleb advises um, is they're always buying these things. They're not uh, trying to time a black swan event. They're constantly putting on the insurance protection Yeah, and they're, they're very sophisticated and are able to uh, implement that strategy as cheap strategy as cheaply as possible. So, so it's, it's tough to do if you're an individual trader, I think. So our, our audience is fairly sophisticated and I'd say 80% of them totally understood that for, if you're new and 20%, you know, a put option is simply gives you a, a, a choice to sell something at a certain price and, uh, you can put the stock to, to someone else. And it's a lot like a, an expensive lottery ticket. You know, the word short, you know, and shorting the market comes from time frame. I mean, you're not supposed to have that stuff on there for a long term. So to have long term short positions, or at least doing it over and over, you know, if if a black swan event does it happen, I like your analogy of insurance better. That hey, eventually I'm going to get in a car wreck, probably. So I better have insurance. Someone's going to hit my car, mm-hmm. or I'm going to hit someone else's. Is maybe the case would be. So that's in, that's interesting stuff. This is, is this the type of trader then that thrives on the black swans theory? We can, uh, you know, get the data and say, Hey, you know, the smart guys who the big money's doing, doing this. 
I've always felt it's tough. Uh, it's it's funny. It, it, it's really funny, Scott, because fundamentally, I wind up being a perma bear. I mean, I look at the fiscal irresponsibility. <laughs> I look at the uh, the liquidity potential liquidity problems in the bond market. I look at the Fed and how difficult their job is becoming with the amount of debt that is that is being you know racked up by the U.S. government. And so I look at all those macro types of things, and you know we could get really nerdy, <laughs> you know, with mm-hmm. with the St. Louis Fed website and all those reports. So in my mind, I'm like, this thing's going to disintegrate. I mean, it's not hard to see. But see, I don't have the timing. Now, if you look at my portfolio, you know, my Delta, I'm Delta positive, right? I've got all kinds of stocks that I own. And I usually mm-hmm. try to look for protection in the last minute, you know, is, is to defend myself. Uh, I'm not a technical analyst so much as a fundamental analyst. So it, it's really fascinating to me that, that the defining, it, one could make an argument that the defining characteristic of the market is unpredictability and yet, on the other hand, these guys are saying, "Look, I'm going to have some cheap put options in in my in my uh, portfolio. Uh, I'm going to buy some cheap put options where I'm really buying time. It's going to leak out. I'm buying something that will probably come worthless, but I'm also saying it's going to happen. I'm going to predict it's going to happen. I'm going to be there for it. What an interesting yeah, balance. Yeah. Tell tell me about uh, Nasim uh, Talib. Am I sp- am I pronouncing that right? Nassim, no, Nassim? Nassim Taleb. Nassim Taleb. Okay, I'm not familiar with him. This is someone you can you tell me a little bit about why he's an important investor? You know, he got his start trading in the '80s, so he's been around for a long time, uh, trading in you know New York uh, banks like First Boston through the '90s and in 1999, along with uh, his longtime colleague Mart Spitznagel, he founded a hedge fund in Greenwich called Empirica. Uh, and the premise of the hedge fund was that it's going to uh, trade for crashes, for protection. It's called a a tail hedge, and it was the first hedge fund to ever do that. Um, It's it's been widely imitated since then. But So they were the first tail hedge fund, uh, you could say black swan fund, buying put options, uh, far out of the money put options, um, refining the strategy, and they shut down in 2004 because a couple of things. I mean, one is that it's a it's a very stressful strategy to trade because you're really you're losing money a lot. So every day you just come in, every day you bleed. You need a big move to make money. They did actually do very well in 2000 2001 when the dot com bubble collapsed. But then the Fed came in and Greenspan flooded the system with money. Volatility went away, and, and uh, the, the strategy didn't do well, which is okay because the market was going up. And if you, you know, one thing you got to know about the strategy is it's not designed to be a large part of anybody's portfolio. You would not put 100% of your cash into a tail hedge fund. Yeah. Uh, what they recommend is you put a small amount, like 3%, you're going to lose 3%. that. Yeah, just 3%. You're going to lose that most of the time, but then when there's a crash, you're going to make a lot, a huge amount. They they call it uh, crash bang insurance. I'm ex- uh, I'm excited and- to read and learn more about this because it has the feel of lottery ticket, right? It doesn't cost me much. Yeah. I'm losing money every month, but boy, if I hit it, right? If I hit it, it feels like I that. A, there's a chapter in the book called Lottery Tickets. <laughs> <laughs> It feels like that. There's an opportunity yeah. to, for some education on some jargon here. You know, we have Dragon King theory, and these are often yeah. spoken about in the same sentence, black swan and Dragon King. But dragon sounds scarier than a swan. Uh, I'm going to yeah. let you define this because I, I look at like very complex systems where you might employ or predict multiple problems that kind of feed on each other. You know, we have a we have a pandemic, and then all of a sudden we have a war in Ukraine at the same time. And then we have a, a, a murder of, of George Floyd and a you know, riot, and these things can really compound each other. How would you describe a Dragon King theory alongside uh, Black Swan theory? What are the similarities? What are the differences? The, the idea behind Dragon Kings was, was uh, 
created by this French mathematician, complexity theorist, physicist, you know, a, a genius uh, named Didier Sornet. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he came up with the idea uh, as a sort of distinct, to be distinct from black swans, because he, he, he doesn't like the black swan theory because he feels like it gives people an excuse when they screw up <laughs> to say, that thing was totally unexpected, nobody could have seen it coming, you know, 2008. Uh, global financial crisis, you know, I lost all the money, but, you know, what can you do? It's a black swan. He says that these events are actually predictable, and he uses some very complicated mathematics, actually designed originally to detect explosions in rockets, uh, to detect uh, tremors that are an indication of a coming uh, bubble and then crash. Mm -hmm. um, so he, he spent a lot of time, he, he created something called the uh, Financial Crisis Observatory, uh, at the university where he taught in Zurich, um, where he experimented on uh, predicting bubbles and crashes on commodities, bonds, markets, indexes all around the world. Um, and there's been some success to it. It's still, I think, unproven. And, and you know, what, what he, it seems like what Didier can do is he can detect when a bubble is forming, but it's very hard to detect when it's going to stop. <laughs> yes. The experiments show that it's it's really hard to time, and and th this is what Nassim says in in the overall strategy of university, the, the hedge fund uh, run by Mark Segel, is that you cannot time markets. It's you can know that there you know there's something coming, and and they definitely believe as you do that there's a lot of risk out there. Um, Mark is said it's a mega tinderbox time bomb is going to blow up. Um, but they don't claim to be able to know when it's going to happen. So that's the, the difference between the two. Is that they both describe extreme events, but one is trying to sort of trade uh, and predict, which is more like speculation, and the other yeah. is managing risk with insurance. It, it seems that if we look at human nature, uh, we're almost guaranteed to build bubbles, uh, whether mm -hmm. it's an individual corruption like uh, at Enron, there's going to be another Enron someday. There's going to be a company who, despite the, you know, and your specialty is regulation, despite regulation, uh, when money is involved, people are going to fudge. And so there's going to be another one. Question is who and when. There is no question that we're going to have another systemic issue like a, uh, a 2008 you know, subprime crisis. It's human nature to want a zero doc or a zero down, no doc stated income loan, right? <laughs> you know, a student loan might be even worse than that. Uh, it's our nature to do stupid things. It's our nature to have, you know, uh, it, to me, it's astounding that we're at, you know, 30 plus trillion dollars and we need a debt ceiling raise every two years so we can saber rattle and blame each other for problems when our off balance sheet commitment is close to 200 trillion now with a 20 plus, you know, shy of 30 trillion GDP. So these things are going to happen, but you, you really hit it on the head is, is it so hard to time this now in my portfolio? If I, if I might take, let's say a person has a moving average, like a, a big one, like a 200 day, nothing choppy. And they say, Hey, mm -hmm. if this thing hits the 200 day fast, there's a chance it's going to go a little further. You know, I'll, I'll take some risk. I'll, I'll maybe short some S and P futures, you know, really leveraged and that can help me maintain and at least keep even perhaps have an exit strategy. If we hit a bottom and pop back up like a trader would, right? Like a swing trader would, but this timing idea is, is intoxicating to all of us. Cause dogmatically we say, look, you can't time the market. You can't time it. It's unpredictable. We can see all this fundamental data that points to, you know, obliteration, but it's really, really impossible to time it. But on the other side, it's intoxicating to think. And it's, it's one of the reasons I, I recommend the book Chaos Kings, how Wall Street traders make billions in the new age of crisis. Because there is this intoxication that if we did have a flux capacitor and we could get our DeLorean up to 88 miles an hour and go into the future and kind of see it, the, the rewards would be uh, astounding. Is that, yeah. is that with, with technology, is that ever, uh, 
you know, you think that's ever going to happen? Are we ever going to be able to really predict that timing with, with how things are going? I mean, are guys good at it? Or do guys look like geniuses? I know this is a long question, so I'll try. I'm, I'm not a writer, so I'm not very succinct. When you look yeah. at, yeah. When, you know, when you look at uh, for example, Crash Boys, or excuse me, Flash Boys, mm-hmm. you know, or you look at the big short even better. You look at the big short. You know, those guys that made money on the big short, they look like geniuses in hindsight. But how many people were kind of trying to time that before that lost their shirts because their timing was off? And these guys just happened to be doing this and it happened. It made them look like geniuses. It's like, oh, Andy, you had insurance on your car. How brilliant that you knew that you were going to get in a wreck this week, right? Well, I had insurance all the time. That's an excellent question. And I think your your instinct is right that it's, it, you know, when they do when they do it and they're successful, they look like geniuses. I mean, Paulson, uh, John Paulson famously made, you know, I don't forget how much, $12 billion or something on his, his uh, uh, housing short trade. But then he, you know, in subsequent years, he lost a ton of money on other bets. You know, he went long gold and that didn't work out. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it is something I do hit on in the book is that the, these are sort of gut trades that, that people make. Sometimes they work out, sometimes they don't. What Universal is doing is they're always short. <laughs> so yeah. uh, they're just waiting for that thing to hit. They don't need to think about predicting or looking at economic indicators or whatever. It's just always there. Yeah. Um, but I, I do, I, it's a great way, way to think about the distinction. And in the first chapter in the book, uh, which is it's called Hell's Coming, uh, tells the story of Bill Ackman, who in early 2020, uh, January 2020, and I talked to Bill uh, for this. Um, he saw what was coming with COVID and really freaked out. Mm-hmm. And part of the reason was he could see that the the numbers showing how contagious it was were potentially exponential. So there was an exponential risk facing the world. And in, in thinking in exponential terms is something that's sort of key to the chaos king mentality which is, you know, Taleb with Black Swans, Didier with Dragon Kings. These are all mm-hmm. exponential or super exponential moves in markets. And the payoffs on those trades can be enormous. So Ackman saw this thing coming. He uh, found um, uh, credit fault swaps on bond indexes were extremely cheap mm-hmm. uh, to short those indexes. The, the risk wasn't being priced in. Uh, he, he told me about how he talk, he called all these CEOs on um, Wall Street, asked them if they were worried. They weren't. Wow. He even emailed Warren Buffett and said, hey, you're going to have to shut down your annual meeting. This is this thing. Buffett says, no, you're crazy, Bill. <laughs> um, I'll be darned. And, and so, he, he, so he could see it coming. Uh, he shorted the market. He spent $26 million on these CDS indexes. Uh, and he made on that one trade two point six billion. Unbelievable. And with that, so that's that's not the crazy part. The crazy part is in uh, March of twenty twenty, when ever when the risk really was being priced in, the market was collapsing. He took the money that he made on that trade and plowed it into the stock market. <laughs> so, wow. Which is something that, you know, I mean, so he, this is a trader just operating on the top of his game. Yeah. I mean, right um, hand, left hand, right. I mean, it's a, co- yeah. it's a combination. Wow. So he made a billion on that trade. So overall 3.6 billion out of 26 million. And that's the kind of exponential gain that you can get on these kinds of trades. And that's the kind of thing that university gets when it buys a, you know, a put option for $2, then the volatility hits and it goes to 60. That, and, and that's a, you know, you don't see that normally in any kind of trade. You know, no. Stocks don't do that, but that's no. what these derivatives can do. And that's what Nassim and Mark saw early on in their trading career was that these uh, derivative contracts have uh, exponential payoffs um, in, in certain kinds of volatile markets. Those multiples are staggering. The, you know, Chaos yeah. Kings, how Wall Street traders make billion in the new age of crisis. Why would I recommend people read this? Because I'm a pretty hardcore fundamental analyst that says, look, um, when these happen after the fact is your opportunity, run your fundamentals, find it, you know, use the Buffett thing, use, use, uh, mm-hmm. 
uh, Ben Graham, you know, find a moat, get a margin of safety, you know, and find a really solid company that's an amazing price. It's this shooting fish in a barrel. Warren Buffett calls it the shooting fish in a barrel experience. So, you know, when the thing yeah. happens, have dry powder. That's the lesson. Don't use your dry powder buying lottery tickets. Have it ready to exploit when this happens because you can't tell them what it does. That's been what I've screamed for years, and it's frankly worked for me. However, I I think of this one, and, and, and when it comes to predicting – there's predicting up and predicting down are two different animals in my view. And I'd like you to comment on this. Uh, let's take uh, uh, Apple or Microsoft, you know, two behemoth, you know, Apple's probably, you know, 60%, probably 50 plus percent of Buffett's portfolio now is Apple, right? He's, he's got loads of money in that thing. Is it really? Yeah, it's over. It's, uh, it's either 40 or 50% of all, like his 80% of his money is in six stocks, uh, Bank of America, American Express, Kraft Heinz, Coca-Cola, and Apple. That's 80% of his money right there. A lot of people don't know that. And none of those companies are really astounding. But here's the thing. If I go back to Apple and you got you know guys like Jobs and Wozniak in their garage, they're so small that you can't see them. And there's a million of these guys trying to do the same thing. It's microscopically small to be noticed in what they're doing to go from small to big. You can't see it. There's a zillion guys doing AI. Hey, how did you know it was going to be Google? Why, why not Yahoo? Why not Ask Jeeves? Why not web crawler, right? How do you know? There's a million of these guys doing this. So seeing small to big is microscopic. You can't see them. But seeing big to small... An example, Obama and Romney are fighting on the, on the stage over whether GM should declare bankruptcy or not. That's how bad their balance sheet was. That's how bad their, their unfunded liabilities to the, to the union guys, retirees were, right? You could see this thing was going to go down. So predicting, you know, predicting a crash is like, you can see the teetering of it. You can see it. And, and that's the thing that intoxicates me about predicting the down rather than the up because they're two different animals in my view, mm -hmm. uh, certainly systemically. I mean, if you look at COVID and you say this thing's coming, well, my gosh, you know, and I guess it, it started and you can say, all right, it's leaking and it's going to go exponential. We can kind of see that. Well, look at the exponential nature of our debt in the United States. So comment on predicting down as opposed to, to predicting up, if you would. Yeah, well, I guess, you know, the, the predicting upside, like, the, you know, for the market, it's, it, as Buffett will say, you know, I, I covered Berkshire Hathaway for the journal for a few years and got to know Buffett. He's betting on America. And yeah. It's gonna go, and his, according to him, it's going to go up. And those companies that you talk about are mostly American that's that's his bet, and he also has a gigantic insurance arm that's constantly yeah. giving him cash to invest in float. companies. Yeah, that's, his float that's is the real yeah. of Berkshire Hathaway. Yeah, um, but that that is a steady upward rise that's reflected in the S and P five hundred and broad market you know stocks. The crashes are fast, right? They, you, you don't have slow grinding declines in the markets generally you have something that's very quick and it happens so fast that if you if you didn't trade very strategically um and smartly ahead of it you're going to miss it and that's the thing like it's it's so hard to time that uh you may know that it's coming but you don't know what's going to set light the fuse you know it could be something in china uh it, you know it could be a war um a pandemic um some, you know, overvaluation of tech stocks that, you know, who, who knew, in, you know, 2000, I, I mean, the value investors were pulling their hair out because yeah. they're like, this is crazy. This is, you know, totally doesn't make any sense. And it kept going. Yeah. Uh, and there were people that were betting against it and they lost their shirts because yep. it just went to insane levels. Yep. And who knew? Maybe, you know, it would keep going. Maybe the internet was this completely... You know, it's a new thing, and the old fundamentals don't apply anymore. Well, actually, they did yeah. uh, to a lot of those companies. Some, like Amazon, uh, 
you know, lived through it and thrived and became giants. So it's just, you know, my, uh, you know, I'm not a trader. Uh, I can't trade as a, as a journal, as a financial journalist. So I'm restricted from doing it. Right. Uh, but it, I think that it's it, it, timing. The downside is, is, is so hard that it's, you know, it's going to generally be a losing proposition. And, and some of those, the big short guys, you know, uh, almost went down. Like Michael yeah. Murray, uh, he he was very early in seeing what was going on. In fact, he helped create the create the, the instruments that were used to right. short the market. And his investors were really angry. You know, if you've seen the movie, yeah. <laughs> saying, give us, our, give us our money back. Uh so he's, he, he almost didn't make it. But yeah, he's yeah, looking at the maturity. He's looking at maturity of those arms, and he's thinking mm-hmm. this should be happening right now. You know, based on my data, these should be happening. Right? Why is it not happening? And he he barely yeah. made it. Right? It's part of the suspense of the movie. Uh, yeah. yeah. The, maybe it's just the perception. You know, as a reporter, I, I'd like your insight on this. I'm old. <laughs> I don't know if I'm that old, but I am old enough to remember Walter. Cronkite briefly, you know, for as as a kid. And I, I think, I think it was like a half hour, maybe, maybe an hour, everything you never need to know in the world could be summed up by the most trusted man in America. Right. And that's the news for the day. Right. Done. Now you got CNN competing with Fox and, you know, news nation, everybody else. And everything has to be a catastrophe, right? It is, it's gotta be hard to get eyeballs as a reporter because the noise you've got to sift through to get into attention eyeballs is, you know, do we, do we catastrophize things more than we did before? I mean, I see alert come on to the screen all the time as if it, you know, Armageddon was right around the corner, right? Breaking news all the time. You know, someone, you know, Donald Trump <laughs> loses, you know, 2% in a poll and the headline is, you know, campaigning crisis or something, Right. With that mm-hmm. said, with the catastrophization of news and this constant eyeballs, is it an illusion that, that there seems to be more things because it seems more chaotic as I look at my children, maybe this is human nature, but I do feel the world is much more chaotic. I, you know, the events, when I was a kid, uh, you know, space shuttle blew up, uh, you know, stuff like that, mm-hmm. but it wasn't nearly the the world that we have today you know you look at what's going on ai is coming out we had george floyd we had COVID. we have a ukraine war we have a bitcoin and a and a crazy cryptocurrency we the world's changing exponentially fast is that a perception you have as a reporter or are we just noisier about being able to find uh, these events and catastrophizing them the idea for this book uh, came out of the early days of 2020 when it definitely felt palpable that things were, uh, were falling apart. Um, we had riots in the streets, COVID, you know, the political atmosphere was toxic. So all sorts of things felt like the the world was sort of, you know, rattling its cage and it was about to just completely blow up. Things have calmed down a bit since then, but I think, you know, we we don't want to forget that what what we saw sort of got a peek at the potential chaos that the world is facing. And you know, I write about this in the book, and it's it's the second half of the subtitle, "The New Age of Crisis." This is something that Taleb has written about in his books. Um, is that the modern world, which is built on technology, trying to optimize everything? Uh, you know, from you know, supply chains, um, travel is you know people are moving around a lot more. The, these things create an environment that can be fragile to to breaking. Uh, or you know, complexity theory uh, looks at this that the world the world is becoming more and more complex. That means humanity has to become smarter. But there's a you know, within complexity theory, there's an idea that we get to a point where it's it's so complex and fragile that it's like a spider web. Everything is connected, and if you just pull on one part of the spider web, the whole thing can come rattling down. Uh, so it's this combination of globalization, technology, 
travel, you know, with, with COVID, um, there, there's a, uh, complexity theorist that I, I write about in the book, uh, called Yanir Baryam, and, and he has collaborated on some papers with Taleb that looks at, uh, global travel and how it's, you know, we're reaching a stage where pandemics, uh, very deadly pandemics can spread, uh, a lot more quickly than they used to. That the you know the viruses are riding on uh, United Airways, and, uh, yeah. uh, you know, and used to be that if you had a very lethal pandemic, uh, say in a, you know in a village in Africa or you know, in China, it generally would it's so lethal that it kills everybody out and then fades away. Mm-hmm. Um, what they what uh, Bar Yam says in his writing is one particular paper that he calls transition to extinction, uh, a scary title, um, that we're reaching the phase of travel in which that's no longer the case because everybody's intermingling. Yeah. People are going to cities, riding around in buses and taxis together, that these lethal viruses can sort of you know, jump out of the box that they used to be in and spread very quickly. And COVID was an example of that. Uh, I think it's it's something that caught everybody by surprise is how quickly it spread. Yeah. Um, that you know is even in late 2019 it was already in America uh, apparently. Yeah. So that there's just a bunch of different things that are happening in the world today that that do make us more uh, susceptible to uh, to these events. And what I'm trying to get at is. You know, first of all, we need to come to the realization that this is the world we live in, and we need to figure out ways to protect ourselves. We need to take these things seriously, um, and uh, and be ready for them, and have plans in place. I, I'm, I feel sort of like with COVID, we didn't really learn our lesson because yeah. there's so many conflicting ideas about it, and and you know, people that are upset about the vaccines, and and you know, it seems like there's yeah. a, a reaction to the. Um, restrictions that were put in place, negative reactions. So if it happens again, I, I'm, I'm kind of worried that uh, things will, the reaction will be so chaotic that we won't be able to contain it. You, you have a, you had a great sentence that struck me uh, in your, in your last comments when you said, talked about the rate at which knowledge is growing. When you said that, I pictured an exponential curve of what we know. And then I kind of mentally superimposed, what does the wisdom curve look like? And if your knowledge curve is growing great at a greater pace than your wisdom curve, that, that kind of describes human nature, right? Wisdom comes from making mistakes and knowledge comes from research and going crazy. COVID yeah. was an interesting well, look at a, look at AI. I mean, yeah. That, yep. There you, know, you go. It's going to really um, take off. And I think that that, that fits perfectly within this idea that thing we're making things so complex that we're not going to be able to control it anymore. And AI is, you know, as yeah. AI creates more AI, uh, yeah. it's, it's very unpredictable. And that is something that, uh, it's the chaos. Is, you know, could be, uh, exponential. Hey, I, you know, my parents dealt with the invention of television. I dealt in my age with the information age of computing and internet connectivity I think my kids have AI and each of those are just massively different. I mean, if the printing press might've been the most important, uh, you know, technology in mankind to kind of launch smarts and education. I mean, AI just takes your breath away. COVID was an interesting thing. I, I agree with you that it's a wonderful learning opportunity. I'm just not sure we got the lesson because what COVID demonstrated, it was a dry run uh, on what it looks like to go from social to primal in our society uh, when things get tough. 9-11 hit, I felt like you know New York kind of banded together. I didn't hear a lot of stories of looting and crime. I'm sure there was yeah. some in the chaos. New Orleans, a lot different You know when, when Katrina came. So these experiments of chaos to see people go from social to primal, fascinating stuff. I recommend everyone pick up a copy. What a great read. Chaos Kings, how Wall Street traders make billions in the new age of crisis. If you've been listening to uh, Scott Patterson and saying, man, I would love to hang out with this guy. I would love to hear more. I mean, I feel bad. The podcast is short. Well, my word, you've got a whole book that he spent 
you know, three years in the making and you can pick his brain in that book uh, and, t- and, and really get an idea of how you want to approach and prepare for black swan events and chaos. Do you want to defend yourself? Do you want to be opportunistic and, and try to become wealthy? How are you going to deal with the chaos that will inevitably become just maybe not so sure when, boy, what a great read chaos Kings, how wall street traders make billions in the new age of crisis the website is scottpattersonbooks.com where you can also learn about you know computerized trading broad pools the quants uh i'll give you the last word as we move forward in this uh new age of crisis uh what's your counsel from what you've learned for our listeners i'll give you the last word uh thanks andy well <laughs> what i'd say is if you're trading be careful because <laughs> it's it's rough out there that's succinct. <laughs> be careful, be wise. Uh, wonderful. I'd love to have you back again when we have uh, some of these chaos events uh, happen. Follow him in the Wall Street Journal. You've been listening to the Cashflow Academy podcast, where we do our very best to make things simple. We'll see you next time. You've been listening to the Cashflow Academy podcast with Andy Tanner. For more information on investing made easy, go to thecashflowacademy.com.